So thanks all y'all for coming out. I really appreciate it. I'm all does too, right? Um, so we just wanted to give you a little information, which is that uh, uh, we just met uh, Shani to today, but uh, I've been or we've been kind of stalking her book on how to do quantum physics at home um, because she's actually like her book came in super handy when we were building our piece upstairs. So we kind of looked her up and asked her to come out here and and uh, build one here, to which she responded, uh, it's kind of a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, <laughs> so, so we asked her just to do a PowerPoint version of it, which I, I think will be just as good. And then if anybody wants to, you can um, build one at home, or maybe artist space with that. You use the basement, right? Harry? OK, cool. Um, just a quick note that bathrooms are in the back left, uh, straight back on the left-hand side, there's a bathroom. There's also one upstairs in uh, kind of the same spot, like come out, of, well, you can't come out of the elevator. Uh, at the top of the steps, go straight back, and it's on your left. So there's two bathrooms in the space. Um, everybody can be, you know, move around or come and go as you please, no, no hurt feelings, like do what you gotta do to be comfortable. And that's about it. So without further ado, we should introduce, uh, who's already been introduced, it, Shani. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit shorter than Lindsay is. Okay, okay. hi, um, I'm Shani, so I was just introduced, and this is the talk I'm gonna give, I guess. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm, I'm one half of a team, and my other half, my father, is not here tonight. Um, that's him, uh, Dr. Prucci. We have an affinity and are known for wearing matching shirts. Um, it's, it's really great. Um, if, if people like see us at, at a hardware event or, or something, like they know, like they, they know how to find us based on the shirts. Um, and this is the book we wrote together. It was published back in 2012 by uh, John Wiley and Sons, Exploring Quantum Physics Through Hands-On Projects. It's basically a how-to guide. It gets rid of a lot of the heavy mathematics, which is exactly why we did it. It's it helps explain how it works without the pretentiousness, without the elitism. Um, I wrote that this was published when I was a junior in high school. Uh, I, before that, I hadn't taken calc yet. I have still never taken a formal quantum physics class. Um, so very much like taking the heavy math out of the scary quantum physics and making it uh, approachable and relatable. Um, so next slide, please. So the very first basic thing that comes to quantum physics is light. Uh, we depend on it. It is why we can see each other right now. Um, <laughs> so we know that light can be distinct particles, photons, or waves. And the waves we know because light has wavelength and its inverse frequency, and photons are the single particles of light. But for years, within the scientific community, this incited fiery debate. Isaac Newton had this belief that light was made of individual particles of photons, and the only reason anyone paid him attention was because he was already famous for gravity. Had he not made a name for himself, the theory would not have gone anywhere. Only in 1918 did Einstein was actually able to show evidence for that with the photoelectric effect, which by the way, was actually what he won his Nobel Prize for. It was not for a theory of special relativity. It was actually for the photoelectric effect that he won the Nobel Prize in 1918. The rest of the scientific community said, light is a wave all the way. They have evidence upon evidence upon evidence. So next slide, please. So the very first piece of evidence was from Thomas Young. So here on the left, we see what is a very stereotypical wave behavior. It's shown in a water tank. So here, if I have uh, a wall that has two slits, if I just have waves of water, I push them through, you can see that there's an interference pattern 
from where the waves will overlap and cancel each other out. That is a very wave-like behavior. If we do the same thing with light from a laser, that we shine it through a piece with two slits, we see that same interference pattern, which is distinctly a wave pattern. Thus, light must be a wave. Next slide, please. So let's complicate it a little bit. Fast forward, give or take a century. We're able now to attenuate down to individual photons, individual light, par light particles. And yet, integrating individual light particles going through a double slit, we still see the interference pattern. This should not happen, and I'll show you why. Next slide, please. So this is why that's significant. If we have uh, a gun and a laser ray gun, if I have a wall, and before that I have a wall with two slits, if I'm shooting individual photons, uh, bullets of sorts, I would expect to only see cumulative damage to those two places. However, what we are seeing in the accumulation from the slide before is we actually see an interference pattern. But if we're shooting individual photons, that would mean that they need to interfere with themselves. Therefore, an individual photon would have to go through both slits simultaneously, which should be impossible. Next slide, please. So with that modification that we saw with the individual photons, we saw that we can make individual light particles behave just like a wave. And for single photons to exhibit this behavior, they must interfere with themselves, which is not possible. So can a single photon be at two places at once? Apparently so, because that's the only way it could create such an interference pattern. Next slide, please. So now we'll take this a little bit further. I promise this is the last further we take. <laughs> <laughs> so using a setup that is actually very similar to the setup um, that you guys had set up upstairs, we end up uh, labeling the paths. So if we set up, um, if we set up uh, li uh, light particles, if we set up a laser and we let it go through two slits, we see the typical interference pattern. However, we can label the paths, we can label the slit it went through by putting polarizers so we can try to tell where that is. By putting those polarizers there, you see we get rid of the interference pattern and we end up getting two distinct accumulation patterns, like two very distinct lines where it hit. That ultimately gets rid of the wave behavior, and that is a very distinct individual particle behavior. Next slide, please. So obviously, us observing it, us trying to mark the path, affected how the light itself behaves. That is a little wonky. Einstein did not like it whatsoever. Einstein had a view which is very comforting for most of us and is kind of like that we like to hold, that reality is objective and deterministic. Everything is here when we're not looking at it. It is here, that is fine. Me observing it, you observing it, doesn't affect it whatsoever. However, Niels Bohr and his Copenhagen School of Thought didn't share this. They thought that reality is probabilistic, that the properties of a particle are only established once they're observed. And this was something that we just saw true in photons. So if this is true in photons, does it not have to hold true for the rest of reality? And this poses a bigger, scarier question. Is the moon really there when we're not looking at it? Because according to Einstein, the moon's always there. But according to the Copenhagen School, well, if we're not looking at it, we don't know, and it's not necessarily always there. Next slide, please. So 
Einstein and his friend Schrodinger weren't huge fans of this concept, obviously. The Schrodinger presented his famous Schrodinger's cat idea, which was actually a mockery of this concept that something could be two things at once before it was observed. So Schrodinger proposed this Gedanken experiment, this thought experiment of, well, I'm going to put a cat in a box. Along in the box, I'm going to put a radioactive isotope, which has a 50% chance of decaying with one, within one hour. I'm also going to include a Geiger counter, which is going to detect if there's a decay in the isotope. If it detects the decay, it's going to release a hammer that will hit and open a vial of poison, thus killing the cat. During this hour, the box is going to be completely enclosed, and with that, we will not know whether the cat is dead or alive. At the end of the hour, we can open the box and we will tell if the cat is alive or dead. For this, this made perfect sense. However, with the Copenhagen School of View, we have a very alive cat that we can see here, alive on our little uh, x-axis, and dead, <laughs> we're, we're tagging the ears, it's fine. Um, so here, before the hour, it is very alive. Between that one hour, we have that it has 50% chance, equal chances of being both alive and dead. And only once we open that box, we have very dead or very alive. And Schrodinger and Einstein did not like the concept that it could be both alive and both dead simultaneously. It had to be both. Um, Schrodinger said that he didn't like this uh, possibility kind of smeared, and he, he actually apologized for the pun himself. So uh, I thought that was kind of nifty. But, but Schrodinger was not a fan of this, and he proposed it like this is so simple that this should make anyone laugh, say, obviously, this is impossible. Well, apparently, it didn't. Next slide, please. OK, so we're going to take a pause from that. And we're going to get to entanglement, because I promised you guys a talk on entanglement. Um, <laughs> so we're going to take a look at the pion decay. A uh, pion decay uh, occurs naturally in nature. But there are three types. Pions can decay into muons and its antiparticle, into neutrons and their antiparticles, or into electrons and their antiparticles, which are positrons. So we're going to take a look at the last of those three examples. So when a pion decays into an electron and a positron, a positron being its antiparticle, because of, um, because of conservation of energy, they're going to have exactly opposite charges. Um, conservation of spin, they're going to have exactly opposite spins. But whenever they travel, they're going to travel at the same speed and the same distance as, for as long as they go. And this is going to be an inherent connection between the two. And this inherent connection is called quantum entanglement, which means that the second I measure the electron, I automatically know properties of the positron. I know that it will, its spin is going to be exactly opposite to the electron. I know that its charge is going to be opposite. I know that I will be able to measure its distance based on the distance at which I found the electron. Next slide, please. So according to Copenhagen interpretation, the second I measure the electron, I automatically know the properties of the positron. And this makes sense. But Copenhagen interpretation, if you remember, also said it could be several properties at once. So how would this work? Once we observe, or once we measure one of the particles, the, uh, the properties must be instantaneously communicated to the positron. This was not really great for Einstein because it would imply and would necessitate communication faster than the speed of light, which would, uh, which violates special relativity, which is what Einstein was kind of known for. Um, so he wasn't, he wasn't a huge fan. Um, so he called this phenomenon spooky action at a distance, that automatically this one particle has to take on properties because its partner particle was measured. 
So Einstein believed that the properties of the electron and the positron are established together at their creation. That it's not something they need to communicate upon measurement, but that's how they are. Next slide, please. So Einstein had these two friends, Podolsky and Rosen, and they needed to solve this problem. If they didn't find a way to explain an alternative to the Copenhagen interpretation, they would be in trouble. So they wrote this paper and presented the EPR paradox and introduced this concept of local hidden variables, which is that these properties were established at the creation of this entangled pair, and it's pre-programmed. There doesn't have to be any communication faster than the speed of light. If local hidden variables can be shown to be true, that would invalidate Copenhagen interpretation because there would be no need for communication. Next slide, please. So let's take a pretty basic example of local hidden variables. So I have a paired glove source. And we know, in general, gloves only come with a left hand and a right hand in a pair. If I send um, one, one of the gloves in the pair to Bob and another pair to Alice, if Bob says, oh, look, I have the right hand glove, he can automatically say, well, Alice obviously needs to have the left hand. That's an example of a local hidden variable. We can only have these two sets and gloves are, you know, the left hand or the right hand of the glove is set when they're created. They don't decide it when they're in the box until they're measured, hopefully. Um, so Alice can record that, you know, they send several pairs to each other, right, left, 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 right, left, right, right, and Bob is going to have the opposite. This is meaningless to both Bob and Alice, but once they combine um, their results, they can see the significance. Now for here, that makes sense. There's only left and right. Cool. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the rest doesn't get so simple. It only gets a bit more shady. So we'll talk about it. So Einstein um, kept this idea, local hidden variables is the way to go. In 1964, uh, which is nine years after Einstein's death, um, John Bell introduced an experimental way to test the validity of local hidden variables. He used a series of mathematical and statistical tricks that if, uh, if you uh, compare a lot of the results, one set of results will give you local hidden variables are true, are valid. Another set of results, local hidden variables are not valid, and thus Copenhagen interpretation is the winner. What is important to note, however, is that this only would invalidate local hidden variables and not non-local or global hidden variables, um, which is something very important to keep in mind. Okay, next slide, please. So let's take a little bit uh, more complicated of, of an example than the gloves. And this is what bothered Einstein. If, again, I have a source that makes pairs of dice, I know the pairs of dice, uh, there's six sides, but when I ship them, FedEx is kind of clumsy with packages, that the dice will roll and will change position during shipping. So if Alice gets a box and she opens the box and she gets, that it's the side that it's on is six and they keep on sharing, uh, they keep on sharing pairs of dice and Alice gets six, two, one, three, one, two, four, five, this is great, this is random, this means nothing to her. Bob gets the other pair, gets matching. But again, to him, this is completely random. When they compare using traditional means of communication, when they compare their lists, they see that their two lists are exactly the same. This is the problem that was posed with entanglement, that they are able to show a distinct connection to each other. And given local hidden variables, this would make things a lot easier for Einstein. So next slide, please. So we have Bell's inequalities. No one was really able to do anything with it 
until 1969 when John Clauser, Michael Horn, Abner Shimoni, and Richard Holt introduced their own variation, which offered a much more effective and doable implementation, especially for experimental purposes. And this is what uh, my dad and I actually ended up implementing in our basement. So we're gonna go through some pictures of that. Um, next slide, please. So for our entangled particles, we chose not to use the pion decay. Um, we're actually going to use uh, entangled pairs of photons. So what happens is we start off with a UV laser, a UV pump photon that's going to be at 405 nanometers. That's going to be a pump photon. That's going to be pumped into a nonlinear optical crystal. Um, that will create sets of entangled photons. So they have the pump photon will actually be turned into a pair of photons that are going to be half the energy, so then double the wavelength. So it's going to be infrared. It's going to be 810 nanometers. They're going to be horizontally polarized and vertically polarized. They're going to be orthogonal to each other, 90 degrees in reference to each other. Um, so this is what we end up using for our entangled photon, uh, for our entangled source of particles instead of the pion decay. There are tons of different types of particles you can choose to entangle. Um, there is a university where you, that they've done beryllium ions instead of photons. So it's kind of whatever, whatever is good for, for, for your experiments at the time. Um, can I have the next slide? Sorry. So the crystal that we put it through is called the BBO crystal, a beta barium borate nonlinear crystal. There are two types of down conversion methods, of entanglement methods. We end up using type one, um, but we have the pump photon, so that's the original photon we feed in. And you can get, you have two photons, your signal and idler. Each of those is a photon in the pair of entangled photons, that they're going to be the same polarization in reference to each other, and perpendicular in reference to the pump photon. Now do mind that their polarizations are still completely random, but when compared against each other, have a connection. In type two, the pump photon is going to be the same, uh, same polarization as one of the, the photons in the pair and will be perpendicular to the second one. We end up using type one. Next slide, please. So in type one, this is what we end up getting. We release, those are all of our photons. And we have three probability cones. Uh, the first, the middle, so the first and the third, the outermost cones, are cones at which the photons do not have an even distribution of the energy. It's completely random. They're still entangled, but those aren't the ones we want because um, it's going to have a lot less stability and a lot less frequency. We're going to go for the middle cone. That's what we want um, because that's going to have exactly double the wavelength, half the frequency, makes things a lot easier. Next slide, please. So we want to maximize the number of photons we can get. If we even had a trillion photons, I could only bet on maybe getting a couple thousand entangled pairs from that. This is like, it is not simple. Um, and you have to like cross your fingers and like say your daily prayers if you want anything to happen that day. So we want to maximize the number of photons we can get. So we actually take two of the BBO crystals, place them 90 degrees uh, orthogonal to each other, and that's going to maximize the number of photons we have. So we can do that. Any photons that were not down converted, mind you, this is gonna be most of them, are not going to be picked up. We're gonna send them directly to a beam stop, which you'll see in a second. They're not gonna continue anymore in the experiment. Okay, so if these are BBO crystals, let's take a look at what happens before that. So this is the laser. It's a 405 nanometer laser. It's ultraviolet. We ended up using a laser from a Blu-ray disc reader. Um, <laughs> It's cheap, I don't know. Um, and we have to purify and filter it because otherwise the light you're gonna get isn't pure. Um, so we do have a bandpass filter that you'll see. Glass polarizer for 45 degrees. Still, it's going to maximize the number of photons we get. A phase adjuster. We're using a quartz plate, again, maximizing the number of photons we can even get to reach the BBO crystal. 
because the more we can get to reach the BBO crystal, the more we can hope to get the darn tangle. Like I said, we do have the beam stop after the BBO crystals. Any entangled pairs, one of the photon in the pairs is going to go three degrees away from the BBO. The other one is going to go three degrees in the opposite direction. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide. Uh, okay. Next slide, please. Sorry. So this is our final setup. Um, so you can see that this is our laser. It's going to hit right here is our BBO crystals. And we have a nice little mirror because we, we can't have everything in, in straight lines. It's, it's a bit of a crowded space. Um, it's going to go three degrees right there. You see that's the beam stop. Anything that hasn't been entangled is going to go straight through there. That's going to be almost everything. So you see that. It's going to hit the polarizers. Those polarizers are going to be used for the CHSH Bell's inequality um, measurements. It's going to go through fiber optic cables into two single photon counting modules. Each, um, each photon in the pair needs its own single photon counting module. The SPCMs are actually based on something called a single photon avalanche detector, a SPAD. A SPAD, how that works is it detects an individual photon or light particle and releases an electrical impulse which say, hey, there's, there's a photon here. The problem with SPADs, however, is they need to be constantly reset and they need to be significantly cooled. So we made our own adjustments and ended up with some SPCMs. Next slide, please. So first of all, the costs of this in-home setup, compared to the, uh, the fees that universities have and how much money they have, this is a fraction of that. Um, but it still is a significant amount of money. Um, for the whole thing, you know, that's the bare minimum setup. That's about $5,000. Um, a pair of BBO crystals, which we used off the shelf, $1,000. Each SPAD is $1,000, which means you're talking $2,000 for, um, for the two SPADs. And that's if you're building them yourself. If you're buying them off the shelf, you're looking at something closer to like, 8,000 a piece. Um, optical components are widely available through online retailers as well as eBay, but you have to be super patient. Um, for us to gather all of these components took a good five years or so. Um, my dad loves collecting components. Um, so if you decided, hey, I want to do this tomorrow, you're looking at like $30,000. However, Compared to like what big universities have, you know, they spend millions upon millions of dollars. You know, this is like what several semesters of tuition. <laughs> um, next, next slide, please. Okay, so we have that setup, and we use that setup to uh, test CHSH Bell's inequalities. And how that works is we were able to take measurements, compare them against each other, and that's where we found the significance. So the results of countless experiments, including ours, used Bell's inequalities to disprove the existence of local hidden variables. Now, our experiment had lots of problems and loopholes with it, but there are, there are universities throughout the country and in the rest of the world, especially in Europe, that were able to, uh, to provide more sophisticated equipment and more advanced techniques, and they were still able to disprove the existence of local hidden variables. Some of these techniques included using beryllium ions instead of photons. Beryllium ions have an 100% rate of detection uh, efficiency. Our photons only had 70%, but even with this, they were still able to show the very same thing. And this is very scary, especially for Einstein's followers and those of us who are comforted at night by the fact that things are still here. Um, <laughs> don't, don't get me started about nightmares. <laughs> So next slide, please. So we use this. Um, we're able to disprove the existence of local hidden variables. But there's also some really cool stuff we're able to do with it as far as technologies. 
Um, there's a lot of up and coming technologies which depend on the use of entangled particles. And I really hope that they become a huge part of how we communicate and how we live our daily lives. One of the big ones is quantum teleportation. I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but like it's not the sci-fi quantum tel like teleportation, you know, the beam me up or whatever. Um, you're not moving a particle as much as destroying its properties and recreating its properties in a different particle. Still, that's really cool. It is. They've been able to do it like tens of kilometers apart from each other, which I guess doesn't sound like a big deal, but I promise it is. Um, the second is quantum key distribution, which is my personal interest. It can be used as a way to create a secure private key for traditional methods of uh, cryptography. So when you communicate, when you text, when you Facebook Messenger, that's encrypted. For you, you see it fine, and the person on the other end sees it fine. However, if someone tried to tap into the communication, hopefully it's encrypted. If you use Signal or WhatsApp, you probably care about your encryption mechanism. Um, this is great. However, there are ways to break the encryption mechanism. There are ways um, to break a secure key exchange. Quantum key distribution is unique in that if someone tries to eavesdrop on the exchange, it will actually change the nature of the communication so that the key exchange does not happen. This doesn't happen with any other technology. That the fact that, it's e that there's someone looking into it alerts both users and will destroy the, uh, the nature of the communication itself. One thing, however, that needs to be considered is that while within the entangled pairs themselves there is a communication faster than the speed of light for the properties of the particles themselves, the communications regarding those, regarding those measurements, has to be done by traditional methods. By traditional, I mean not faster than the speed of light, so whatever speed we have uh, at this current time, so text message, I don't know, like if you want to use smoke signals, but basically as long as it's slower than the speed of light, that's good. Um, there are lots of shortcomings in these quantum technologies. They've been able to find loopholes, they've been able to find ways to uh, successfully eavesdrop on a quantum key distribution. However, all of the problems that we see are not due to the theory itself, but due the due to the technology we currently have today and are testing it with. Um, so hopefully in the future, you know, there are people who dedicate their entire lives to this. Um, so more and more we're finding uh, more secure technologies and more appropriate technology to apply this with, but still we can only get as far as our, our technologies can bring us and only as far as we can bring our technology. So thank you. Hi, is this okay? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Shani, for that talk and the demonstration. I have been thinking about and writing about quantum physics for a long time, but I've never actually seen what that looked like, so that was really super cool for me. Um, I hope that what I say is gonna connect up with what you presented, but also I wanna try to link it to what Tina and Amal have done um, upstairs, um, the pieces on display. Um, I begin with a question that's raised for me by your talk, which is, why keep doing double slit experiments at all? Even ones where we already know the answers, what's, what's the purpose of repetition and demonstration? Um, and I think this response may be a little bit weird because I'm gonna kind of come out on the side of Einstein and Schrodinger in some ways, but it's primarily because of why they continue to ask questions and the ways in which they continue to ask questions um, and the ways I think they still haunt quantum physics today. Um, as far as I can tell, and I think you basically pointed to this, um, quantum physics is motivated by the constant need to ask one question and to ask it 100 times, a 1,000 different ways. Basically, they want to ask over and over again the question, what is light? What's its matter? It's a question that was inaugurated by the first crude double slit experiment in 1801 and one that propelled the majority of thinking about the quantum theory. The advent of quantum theory was the scientific revolution of the 20th century. The observation of the counterintuitive laws of the quantum world, that tiny world where matter simply did not behave in the old Newtonian ways, where gravity did not always pull, where a body might jump through space-time, disrupting any continuity of movement, 
where something could spin twice to go around once. It changed everything. Irvin Schrodinger, author of the theories, one, of the hallmark, uh, one of the theories hallmark thought experiments, was one of the few scientists other than Einstein who realized the far reaches of the epistemological conundrum uh, of entanglement, the way it rewrote everything science had been and could become. After Bohr claimed to have completed the theory through the Copenhagen interpretation, Schrodinger confided in a letter to Einstein. He wrote, quote, it seems to me that what I call the construction of an external world that really exists is identical with what you call the describability of an individual situation that occurs only once. Right here, linking um, reality and describability, right? Uh, different as the phrasing may be, the present quantum mechanics, by which he means the Copenhagen School, is not conscious of the problem at all. It passes it by with blithe disinterest, but it is probably justified in requiring the transformation of the image of the real world as it has been constructed for the last 300 years since the reawakening of physics based on the discoveries of Galileo and Newton, end quote. Once we perceived a world so small, so quirky, so strange, observations ceased to be intuitive. We had to see this world in new ways, and we had to see our own world the way we sensed our world in new ways too. In fact, it was no longer a matter of uh, direct sight at all. It was a matter of physical effects and mathematical predictions. And even more, what could be perceived and thought could not be described by the methods and language that we had available. Our existing, link, our existing image of the real world did not comport with the world as it is. Even today, despite the thousands upon thousands of pages of ink that have been spilled, or I guess, like, you know, computer particles or whatever, <laughs> uh, that have been spilled trying to articulate the theory for a lay audience, it remains so fundamentally non-intuitive, so virtually impossible to describe, as to thwart any attempts to express it straightforwardly in language. So we keep studying and we keep describing. A couple of quotes from the description of Tina and Amal's exhibition upstairs. One, quantum entanglement refers to the pairs or groups of particles for which the properties of each cannot be described independently of the others. Even when they are really far away from one another, these particles must be apprehended as a system. Two, another name for causality is dependency, to come from or be given to, to wait for or follow after, to be conditioned by, Dependency is embedded in the concept of entanglement as well. So I ask, what is the link between quantum theory, physical experimentation, and art? If art takes up the quantum to speak of the macro world beyond the micro world of waves and particles, even though both worlds are, of course, made of waves and particles, from a physical standpoint, should we dismiss, should we dismiss that as mere metaphor? When it appears as art, is the conceptual apparatus representational, or is it something else? Outside of the world of uh, quantum study, can its concepts speak of ontology, of the what is? Is there any real relation between quantum phenomena and the activities that go on under that same name elsewhere? Or is there a cut, a sharp distinction between physics and art, as there is between the quantum and the classical worlds? To speak to these questions, I think a few definitions might help. The first is quantum. Quantum designates the smallest discrete particle involved in any physical interaction. A quantized particle does not gradually change states, but instead leaps from one state to the next. Though many features of the quantum world are not understood as discrete particles, there are, of course, elements of the quantum world that are continuous rather than quantized, the name derives from Einstein's observation that light at high frequencies can behave as though mutually independent light quanta, or atoms of light, separate particles, which are now known as photons. The second is observation. Within Heisenberg's theory of quantum uncertainty, observer does not name a subject position, nor does it imply cognition. Instead, it names the moment at which the classical world interacts with the quantum world. According to the Copenhagen interpretation, the quantum world could not be described with a form of realism. It could only be described through statistical formulae. The formula necessary for describing any uncertain particle in the quantum world is known as a wave function. To collapse the wave function or, to, uh, or give it variables, that is, exact coordinates, the particle has to in some way interact with the classical world. Such interaction determines the particle. Ultimately then, observer is defined tautologically as that which collapses the wave function. The third is the cut. Werner Heisenberg described the jump from the classical to the quantum world as happening across the schnitt or the cut. He thought you couldn't get across it. The observer could never see the quantum world as it is because the classical world would always interfere. For Heisenberg, this meant that the quantum theory and classical theory could never cohere, and any description of the quantum world 
would, uh, would be done through the limits of an always insufficient classical language and images. He described this impossibility saying, quote, you have to enter along the schnitt, but the schnitt can always be moved. You can always describe something quantum mechanically, which we were describing classically before. You can always include a little more of your apparatus in the quantum mechanical system, as long as some part of the apparatus remains classical. But when the schnitt moves, a contradiction between the law-like consequences of the new hidden properties and the more fluid relations, relationships of uh, quantum theory will be unavoidable, end quote. The cut for Heisenberg is a categorical divide. I'd, ever ne I'd actually never met Shani before today, as neither had Tina or Amal. Um, and when I arrived in New York yesterday and got on the train, I got an email from her, which was actually my first direct contact with her. Um, her email ended with a quote from Arthur Cayley, a mathematician, who wrote, quote, as for everything else, so for mathematical theory, beauty can only be perceived, not explained, end quote. I love the idea of things that can't be explained. But I was tempted to reorient the quote as a question by way of Einstein. Even if something can't be explained, can it be described? When I looked up from my phone, I saw through the bobbling double doors that in the train car behind me were several young Showtime dancers performing, really astounding acrobatics. I'm sure you've seen it, swinging from the poles of the train, coming so close but always missing the passengers, just proprioception on lock. And their coordination had not only to do with dancing, but also moving in and out of their roles, constellating as Barker, dancer, and audience. As they finished and walked up and down the train to collect the tips, they were trying to catch their breaths, and I realized that one hat was wearing an I Can't Breathe Eric Garner shirt. I was moved by the paradox, which is of course no paradox at all, watching through the layers of reflections to see his chest heaving, and to hear the young people laughing and applauding each other as they exited the train. What does it mean for beauty to be perceptible but not explainable? I thought of Shani's sign off as I'd watched these young folks and my observation became entangled with today's event. Or what I mean is, the relationship between perception and breath, between beauty and coordination, the thing that collapses the wave function and the living, breathing observer and these, and these folks changing in and out of position and role, dependent, a unit, struck me as perhaps the central question that, were, that links the works of Amal and Tina to what Shani was presenting. Between perception and explanation, after the physical experiment, what are description and demonstration? Where does art lie? What I mean is, of course one can always make the objection that there is no continuity between the micro world of the quantum and art made here in the macro world, in the, in the macro world of classical physics, that any connection between that world and this world is mere metaphor. But what is a metaphor but a way of carrying, in Greek, to transfer? And as a means of transport, can a metaphor or a concept which composes ontology through thought ever be anything other than material? Description as writing, as art, as a, the as a thesis, makes, uh, making sense of what our senses sense. And what if sometimes our perceptions, our taking in of sensation, might be inseparable from what we put back into the world, dependency? Not a sight, but a scent, smell, Old English breath, to breathe. Here I'm thinking of synesthesia, the collapsing of the senses, that strange fact of breathing. A breathing is both constitutive of and in excess of everything we do. Of all the art, of all the thought and art we make, and of Amal and Tina's sound experiments upstairs. In laboratory life, the construction of scientific facts, sociologists of science Bruno Latour and Steve Woolgar account for the practices, erasures, and excesses of experimental observation. And they turn to astrophysics, a field that depends heavily on quantum theory, to show that the most valuable experiments often become possible because of the extraordinary capacity for surprise, for us to be surprised and for the world to surprise us beyond its express, expected limits. These experiments are enabled by our capacity not merely to see, but to hear what is beyond what we expect to find and mean. They write, quote, Sometime in late 1967, Jocelyn Bell, a research student at Cambridge Radio Astronomy Laboratories, noted the persistent appearance of a strange section of scruff on the recorded output from an apparatus designed to produce a sky survey of quasars. Here, if scrutiny of the recording had been automated or if Bell had been sufficiently socialized into realizing that the persistent recurrence of scruff was impossible and hence unnoticeable, the discovery of pulsars would have been much longer in coming." End quote. As Latour and Wolgar imply, Bell made the observation of a bit of scruff against the given scientific impossibility of that scruff. 
against the technical and theoretical imperceptibility of an invisible pulsar. Bell's unruly experience of and her insufficient socialization in the laboratory allowed for the emergence of an improper perception that would have profound implications for our understanding of matter and for what it might mean to experiment. But rather than simply affirm the ways in which unruly perception and thought are bound up with the experiment and experimental conditions, that is, the ways in which experience is part of an experiment, Latour and Woolgar continue by analyzing the ways in which such unruliness is ordered for the purposes of knowledge production. In their account, the scientist's task mirrors the classical task of the artist of producing order, which is to say meaning, out of chaos. This means eliminating the, the virtual multiplicity that always undergirds experience of, uh, or the world in order to actualize a particular meaning from the physical experiment, altering description into explanation. Physical experiments, then, contend with the problem of presumed order, which retrospectively places limits on the description of the phenomena or makes a meaning visible while rendering the rest obsolete. The quantum physics thought experiment, instead, as well as Tina and Amal's work, in questioning the presumption of order as eminent to the material world, in being concerned instead with excess, association, and coincidence, can reopen the field of experience to new perceptive and therefore descriptive possibilities. This also opens up a way of thinking of the role of the artist, not as that person who makes determinations and orders chaos, but as the asker of questions, moving matter and constantly altering aesthetic productions, art as an improvisatory process. Again, to quote from the booklet for this, from this, for this exhibition, the artists embrace a pluralistic process-based approach to artistic production, prompting critically, and I would say ontologically, unresolved questions. Or as Einstein would say, quote, every observation presupposes an unambiguous connection known to us through natural laws between the phenomenon to be observed and the sensation which eventually penetrates our consciousness. With modern atomic physics, however, these laws have to be called into question, end quote. To know what we are sensing, to observe it all, we have to continue to change our theory. We have to ask new questions for, quote, it is the theory which decides what we can observe. That's also Einstein. Um, to end, in 1951, the great black sociologist, W.E.B. Du Bois, was arrested by the US government for pro-Soviet activities. Einstein offered to appear as a character witness, and the charges were dropped. The occasion was less exceptional than you might think in that Einstein had said more than once that racism was a disease of white people. His entire COINTEL profile consists not of documentation of his communist activities, but of his anti-racist ones. Einstein overtly denied that his anti-racist activism had anything to do with his science. But somewhere, I think it must. But it means that we have to hear Du Bois enough to perceive it. I mean, it was Du Bois who let us know that, quote, between me and the other world, there is ever an unasked question. How does it feel to be a problem? End quote. Einstein had been writing to Du Bois. Du Bois had been writing to Einstein. Du Bois was doing a totally different kind of sociology, a sociology from the other side. And Einstein was trying to see another world. My sense is that it was Du Bois who fully articulated the question that Einstein spent his entire life trying to answer, trying to answer from the other side. And the importance of that, I do not think, I think cannot be overstated. They wrote real letters to each other. Einstein published a short letter in Du Bois' journal, The Crisis, which Du Bois had sent a letter to ask for in the first place. They were writing something else to each other too, though, something undocumented, almost imperceptible. They were both writing across the cut to the other world. And this is crucial. The question for both was always, most centrally, how to affirm the construction of the object and the person constructed as an object, in the case of Du Bois, as a real problem for thought how to think endlessly, reflexively, the reality of the thinking of the object and the implications of, the thought, uh, the implications of thought itself as a matter of matter. Einstein's struggles resisted the ways in which statistics might solve or totalize or complete quantum theory. To Einstein, these solutions masked the paradox rather than uh, resolving it. And in masking it, they nullified its epistemological force. To keep thinking the paradox, to keep the paradox available for thought, to keep it an endless problem for thought, a site for enduring struggle, one had to keep seeking for the reality of the quantum world beyond mathematical explanations and probabilistic knowledge. 
It was, in fact, Einstein's endless questioning, the challenges of the EPR paradox, that would lead Bell, Shimoni, and others to continue to ask questions and to test the theory with physical experiments far beyond Bohr's time. Einstein wanted to be able to describe what was real, but first he had to be able to sense it. The animating question for physics throughout the 20th century is a refracted version of the animating question for social life, specifically black life in the US. If Du Bois asked in 1903, how does it feel to be a problem? In asking about light, Einstein repeatedly asked, how do you feel a problem? How can you sense it? Or what can happen through repetition and demonstration? How can we keep the paradox available for thought? Or how can we breathe when we can't breathe? That's it. OK, hi. I have a question about hidden, um, local hidden variables. You said that they were disproved, but you did not say how. Also, um, uh, the, uh, you said that um, you can produce single photon and then uh, break it into millions of uh, photons uh, just placing the crystal and produce some pairs of enta some entangled pairs. But uh, how you define that is entangled or not entangled? Okay, um, so I guess several parts for that. So first, as far as um, taking a photon and putting it, uh, pumping it through a BBO crystal, it's only going to separate it into two other photons. Um, it's not, it's, it's only if it is, uh, if there is a successful down conversion that happens, it's only going to be into two photons. Um, anything that is not down converted will stay the same and go straight through. Um, how you confirm entanglement is going to be, um, you, we, we know that some processes do that. I wouldn't be able to speak further on that. Um, as far as validating that local hidden variables is, uh, does not exist. That is a result of the Bell's inequality. Like I said, uh, Bell presented a lot of mathematical and statistical, almost trickery, I'd say. And he said, well, if we take some results of measuring entangled particles, compare their polarizations and the results of their measurements against each other, with that correlation between them, if you measure uh, coincidence counts, given that you know after you put it through whatever equation, uh, it's greater than two or less than two, it will either prove or disprove local hidden variables. Um, it is strictly putting it against uh, Bell's own theory and then that further implementation by CHSH. Um, I didn't present the math up there. Um, and yeah, but sorry. Uh, this is a question for Lindsay. Um, so how did you land in this place where you're writing about art and quantum physics and sociology and your own personal experiences. And how did you get to this place? I mean, I, that's probably a huge question, but what was the sort of um, simple trajectory? Sure. Uh, I mean, it's interesting because I, the, sim the simple answer is that I took a, a, a theoretical physics class as an undergraduate in my first year of college to fulfill my only science requirement. and. I didn't have to do any math, although I was fine at math, but it was, that was part of it, you know, and then but it blew my mind, you know, and then um, later when I was ready to go to graduate school, I think there were some other things that Foucault had blown my mind, so I went to graduate school, and then in graduate school, I found black study, and that blew my mind. So then the question was, how did all these things go together? Why, how was I changing, and why was I changing? And I spent a long time writing about these things that I, had, that I thought had just been important to me, that they had just sort of exploded in my brain at various points. Um, <laughs> which I, I loved, you know, and um, I think then 
what really, I think, happened for me was that I, after I had written all this um, very objectively in the way that you're supposed to write as an academic, I was then an adjunct for, or couldn't get a job for many years. So then I started really thinking about how it mattered, you know, for my own life, for my own work. Um, so I think that's kind of, kind of part of it. And so I think when I'm, when I'm trying to think, I'm often trying to think what are the relations among um, things that seem unrelated. That's a really motivating question for me, you know, and maybe that's why entanglement in particular, you know, is, a, is an interesting question for me. How do two things that should not be able to be related, how do they remain related? You know, and um, so I just think I'm kind of always working through um, the ideas that I, everything seems to be happening, maybe not for a reason, but in a relation, you know, and so positing those relations has just been, a, I guess, a, a productive method for me, but also a source of, you know, inquiry. Also, I really fell in love with those physicists when I was reading about them, you know, the way they write to each other and talk to each other is really quite beautiful and not what you, not beautiful in a different way, you know, than the physics itself. Oh, so. they were definitely not like anything you'd expect them to be. Um, fun fact, one of, maybe it was Schrodinger, uh, came up with this famous equation while he was skiing with his mistress. Um, so yeah, they definitely had a lot more fun of a life than I have. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, Einstein was on the run, and they, you know, they were they were working through World War II, and you know, there was the claim that that they were doing Jewish physics, you know, and yeah. um, you know, you have some some of the people in the Copenhagen School wouldn't renounce, you know, um, wouldn't wouldn't renounce that um, critique, right? That they of the the kind of proposal that they do Aryan physics, and and then there were the people with the you know. Uh, Einstein and Schrodinger on the run and, and like, you know, trying to figure out um, how to keep doing physics and they were writing all these letters to each other and they were deeply passionate, important questions that were really epistemological questions that did not have anything practical to do, right, with, with the war in these ways, I mean, despite the fact, obviously, that there was the atomic bomb, but they were asking other questions, you know, um, and they were really urgent and they were super passionate. Thinking and studying were so important to them and I think that's part of what, yeah, draws me to them. What's the difference between classical and quantum? <clears throat> and if it is something that's not observable, I like, might have misunderstood the observer, then uh, is quantum mechanics just something that we uh, categorize by not being able to view it? Um, I can or you can, I don't care. Um, so as far as the... Uh, the boundary between quantum mechanics and classical physics, or quantum physics and classical physics. Um, we see that with classical physics, uh, the world behaves exactly as we expect it to. Uh, if I were to throw my water bottle at, you know, at the floor, it would behave exactly like I want it to. Um, but we see that the, thank you. <laughs> I, to be fair, I didn't even see you were throwing it, so <laughs> that was a surprise. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, the more and more we zoom in, we see that things are not continuous, that things get grainy. Um, this is actually defined by uh, Planck's constant, which uh, is, is a number constant which describes the graininess of the universe. And only when we get to that point where it is so grainy um, are we able to see the effects of quantum physics. So we're not just talking, I mean, we're talking subatomic particles, so we're talking photons, we're talking electrons, but they've been able to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, Anton Zeilinger at the University of Vienna in Austria, or University of Austria in Vienna, um, he was able to show quantum effects with uh, Buckminster fullerene molecule, so C60. Um, that's 60 carbon uh, atoms. That is mind blowing um, to see that we're not just at individual particles. Of course, there's going to be a line where you can't do that um, because as we have matter waves, you know, it still needs to be small. Um, but there is going to be that boundary where you're able to, there, there is a significant difference um, that you are able to tell mathematically using Planck's constant. Um, 
as far as from a mathematical point of view. But. I was going to say um, that, yeah, the, the thing with the, the buckyballs or whatever is, like, astounding because they're so big, but they they're still huge. behave. Yeah, and they still behave, like, in this quantum way. Um, I feel like I'm not, like, a physicist or whatever, but, um, but, like, one of the things that is, like, the difference between classical and quantum is, like, in quantum physics, like, things can be in two mutually exclusive states at the same time and in, like, the regular world they don't tend to do that um and like one of the reasons that we were interested in making the um piece upstairs that's a mox ender interferometer um which is that thing that makes the green laser like things on the wall um is that it works both in classical physics like you can see the light making those interference patterns and if we put the polarizers to show which um to to like observe it to like force the light to show its path, um, then it makes the wave pattern disappear in the way that Shani was talking about. So it works on the quantum level and on the classical level. Um, but it, yeah, so that's sort of, yeah, did you wanna? <laughs> okay, sorry. You, but you said something really cool about like, I don't know what the difference is. Uh, to me, it's always like if it's really small. Okay, and also superposition does work in classic classical physics, right? Like a wheel, a wheel is, um, has two states of motion. At the, like a, I'm talking about like a regular wheel, like on a car. Like it's both sliding like this and it's turning like this. And those states are superimposed. Ducks swimming around in the, the wake of a ship. A lot of, there's a lot of examples in classical physics of superposition. Just things being in the two states at the same time in the same thing, right? That's superposition. But in quantum superposition, that gets a little bit a little bit different. But okay. But I just wanted to say this, the question of the observer, and Lindsay, I think, actually said it when, but maybe it went really fast, and maybe you already know this. And I don't, the thing is, nobody knows this stuff. Or if somebody does, but it's not me. But I'm going to just say this thing, is that what was really helpful for me to think about, the idea of the observer in science stuff, it's not like an art stuff. It's not who's looking at something. The observer is any, it could be like a house plant, it could be this pen, it's any physical interaction from the classical state into the quantum state. It's usually so something it's that just measures, like, but. What? <laughs> it's usually something that measures, I think, but yeah. yeah what? It's usually something that measures. It's something that measures, yeah, it's, it, but it's not even just measures, it's like presence, right? So observation in a science way literally could be a plant. Not, no offense to plants, because I really, plants probably know a lot more. But you might want to like start asking, and to come back to this very first question, this, and this is where my real question is, this is my next question for y'all. This is where I'm tripped up. This probably won't be very exciting or anything, but it's a real question, and it's, is, in, is entanglement actually, like, you know, entangled with measurement, right? When you, when you put a, a ruler up to something, and you're like, oh, this is four inches. Isn't that thing also telling you about a ruler? Do you, <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? No, no, it, it, why are we even doing this? But you know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like is measurement <laughs> bound, is measurement also entangled? Like, you know what I'm saying? Because that's the problem of observation, is that we're all in there. Like we're, trying to look at something that we're inside. Like earlier, okay, we were stuck in the elevator before this talk. Okay, me and Harry and Lindsay, we were just coming down here and we were stuck in the elevator because it, like the door got messed up. And I can't remember what I was gonna say. <laughs> but there was this point where Harry said something really amazing because we heard, okay, finally after 45 minutes when the, the the hero came to rescue us, which was a voice called Jason. <laughs> they came from somewhere around us and we could, like everyone could hear us, but we couldn't hear them. Like, or, or like someone was talking to us from the upstairs and we could hear, you know, it was just some weird acoustical thing. But anyway, Harry was like, maybe it's inside us. <laughs> like, cause we really, like there was, I'm gonna pass this back over, but that, that's all I'm saying. Like there's, there's an idea of entanglement that my, <laughs> 
So is your question fully answered now? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, like I think what you're asking is like there's this bifurcation between like classical physics and quantum physics, and it's like maybe somebody in this audience can answer because I see like at least four scientists but in there. I think it's the point being in part that it's not static, you know, and that's that's what they're talking about 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 being able to move back and forth in size, you know. And this is what I was kind of trying to say about Heisenberg saying that there's some cut, some divide, and on one side particles and stuff behave in one way that sort of doesn't really fit with kind of traditional Newtonian physics. You know, gravity causes something to drop, whatever. And there, gravity doesn't work that way. Or, um, you know, electrons, they used to be described as uh, spin one half particles because they spin twice to go around once, right? So the difference can, it can be moved at any, at any time. The difference is how the behaviors work, right? On one side or the other. Um, and that's the idea is that you can move, you can move the cut back and forth, this is why you can now, the, we used to think it was so, so tiny, but now they'll be able to do it with buckyballs, right? And so that's kind of, I think, d gets at maybe part of that division or something. Um, if, I can, if I can add something, sorry, um, as far as Tina's question, um, I think what's important to note is uh, the use of the word entangled, um, because there is what is referred to as purely quantum entanglement, um, which is limited in and of itself to subatomic or uh, to particles which uh, qualify within uh, within uh, what uh, what quantum effects can work with it, and then there's entanglement from uh, a philosophical point of view. So when we think about measuring something, uh, using a ruler to measure. Uh, my backpack or something, already we know that's in the scheme of, of, of classical physics. Um, that is way larger than a, a, uh, a buckyball. Um, so when we talk about something like that, we can talk about what measurement means, uh, is, especially as arbitrary uh, settings of what we're going to use, and I have thoughts about that. Um, but uh, within systems which we are able to see and interact with on a daily basis, that's not going to be a uh, true quantum entanglement. So, sorry. Uh, um, I guess continuing on the topic of measurement, um, I was watching a talk recently, uh, this lecture online, they were talking about like four main kind of pillars of measurement, I guess, and uh, the, the de Broglie bohm um, any worlds theory, uh, wave collapse theory, or Girardi, Rimini, Weber Oh, like the, the De Broglie wave, matter waves? Yeah. Okay. And then, um, and then cubism. And I guess, which one are you leaning towards? And then if you could expand, if you could expand on those, uh, like how they're kind of affecting, you know, uh, ways of, of measuring and thinking about this sort of topic and uh, how, how might quantum computing play into that? All that. Um, whatever. For, um, you can answer first. Or I but the question is like, what, which do we think is like? Like what school? True or theory? theory. I guess. I guess like I mean they all. Uh, it seems like they kind of go. Uh, I mean, I love the idea that multi-worlds theory is thinkable, but I don't. <laughs> I mean. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think they they kind of gradiate from like uh, fringing on classical quantum to. To maybe almost philosophical kind of abstract. So, um, for, for me, I'm always less concerned about like what what is sort of an accurate description of the world, and more. And I, for me, I'm always more interested in how the thought became possible in the first place, and so how these scientists are able to sort of keep pushing and expanding thoughts in different ways. For me, multiple worlds is one of the most kind of interesting things that becomes possible as like a scientific phenomenon or imaginal scientific phenomenon. Um, but I'm not, you know, a physicist, and I don't really, you know, I can't. I couldn't say that like I know the I know the math and I know I think that this one is the most accurate or something like that. So I'm chasing like a different epistemological problem, I think, but you might have a better sense. Yeah, I guess I'm just curious how they relate to each other and just just to get a clear understanding of the four cuz I'm from what I'm they were talking about it like very clearly because it seemed to be like the uh, I guess a good a good variation of of the the, the spectrum of thought out there, so uh, just whatever you could offer, and then also just about how computers, because I, I, I don't know, I was listening to something else about quantum computing, and they're saying that like it's not really applicable to practical daily use, but maybe to measurement things, things within the quantum space. So this sounds like a situation that that would be. 
Um, so as far as the four pillars of measurement, the only one with which I am even remotely familiar is the De Broglie matter waves. Um, and it's the concept that, you know, everything exists uh, as a matter of probability. Um, and the larger matter gets, uh, the less wavy it becomes. Um, and I do have a very strong belief in that, but I won't, I, I'm not able to speak to the other three. As far as quantum computing, uh, that's actually really cool because um, how computers work right now is we have bits. Um, it is a binary unit, and with binary, it's either zero or one. Um, and zero literally means off, one means on. And bits can give us however much information. So I know a byte is eight bits. Um, and I can go from there and build and build and build. And we know if you're purchasing a computer, you want the maximum number of memory. You want the largest amount of memory you can have. So I choose, you know, one terabyte uh, hard drive over, you know, four gigabytes. Um, so when we talk about bytes or bits, we're talking about those individual binary units. What's interesting about uh, quantum computing is that if we can use qubits, a quantum bit, it can simultaneously be zero and one. So instead of only having uh, however many calculations, we can have two to the number calculations because we don't need to limit it to either one or zero for the calculation. We can use both of those settings with quantum bits. Um, it's super cool. Uh, I know IBM is currently, I think they just released um, with a seven qubit or eight qubit uh, quantum computer. Um, but that is taking advantage of something being in a quantum superposition of states, of being a quantum bit, and making use of that for uh, computing power, which we can't even begin to fathom. Hi. Hi. My question is the following. Could measurement be relative to the observer, and given such a notion, is it even feasible to show it is true or false via the scientific method? Well, Einstein says measurement is relative to the observer. I cannot speak to this. <laughs> Right, right, depending on like speed or whatever, right? Like time slows down if you're going faster, whatever. It's relative to the, to the observer, whatever that is. You know, I don't, I don't really understand the second part of the question. I guess, but yes, it can be relative to like the observer is, according to Einstein. Like, <laughs> is is reality, like, is is real? I, I guess, uh, I'm. You can or really just maybe has more moving parts, right? And maybe um, I think it's a way to you can, think of You it. can tell me if this is what you mean, I guess. Um, that because of how we measure something, uh, if we do or if we don't measure something, it changes the nature of, of how that behaves and how that affects the scientific method. Is, is that along the lines of what you're asking? Along the lines, yes. Um, I actually haven't thought about that. Um, my... Uh, my viewpoint and my work within quantum physics is limited to, I don't like thinking about the implications because it gets scary and I, I like answers. <laughs> so I personally cannot speak to that. Um, I think it's a very important question, um, which is why I haven't thought or written extensively about it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, the scientific method is itself a kind of fuzzy notion, though. You know, I mean, it's technically invented by John Dewey, the like pedagogue. It then becomes like you know taken up for schools mostly, and then physicists reject the idea of the scientific method because things actually happen in much more ad hoc ways. So you know, you've got you know all these physicists in the 40s saying there's nothing more deplorable than the scientific method. It's like, nothing's tabular, it doesn't work that way. So, I mean, I, you know, it's itself a kind of, I, I mean, I think that 
certainly quantum physics is already pressing against the very sort of desirability of a sort of set method. And so this kind of fuzziness or this messiness, I think, is, um, is part of the, the beauty of the way that quantum physics fucks with like, you know, institutional science or something, you know. Who has questions, sorry? I think you were first, you were second, and you were third. But maybe these would be the last three questions. Hi. Um, I have a question. It's like, so within the science, what we do normally is just trying to build instruments to help with measurements, like often. And I feel like while working, there's always a, like, a weird illusion that we look at the world through a pinhole and we look at the kind of the shadow cast into the, the, our side. So it's like, this is our room, we have a pinhole there, we look over the other side and we can see the shadow and we observe and guess what's going on on the other side. So that like kind of cast, uh, the question is like, do, do you feel like through your like work, um, is there like a limit for our observation or if there's a limit, um, is religion um, part of the conversation from that point? Because I work with uh, uh, astrophysics a little bit at this point. I don't know why. But um, I, I was often asked uh, the question about um, how does God feel about it? And I don't. I'm not religious, but I think that's an interesting question. And I, I want to hear how you two think about it. I think uh, the nature of how, I think how we, our research is limited, especially by our current available technologies. Um, as far as from uh, how we experience reality or religion or a higher being, um, that's not something I can speak to. However, um, there's uh, this wonderful researcher. His name is Professor Dean Radin. He's based in California. I met him a few years ago. And he actually has done a lot of the classical, uh, he, he's done the, the double slit experiment with, uh, with uh, different sorts of people who are religious or um, with, with uh, psychic abilities and see how they actually impact that. He has a lot of great research about that. Um, and I definitely recommend looking into that. Uh, he has, uh, I visited his labs. Uh, his setups are definitely amazing. Um, I, however, kind of cannot speak to that personally. I. I don't believe in God, um, so I don't have, uh, I, well, I definitely think there are limits to how we uh, experience the world. I don't necessarily view religion as having a stake in it. Um, I think in addition to this question of the limitations of technology, there's a, a, sen a question about the limitations of how we, what we think counts as something sensible or seeable, right? You know, and so many experiments, um, there ends up being some kind of effect that wasn't expected, and then you have to start figuring out what that thing was in the first place, right? Which means paying attention to something you didn't even mean to pay attention to in the first place. You know, the tracks of electrons in a cloud chamber, right? That's the first way we like see electrons. It's not through direct observation or something like that. And what I was talking about with Jocelyn Bell, the idea that you shouldn't be able to hear this weird scruffy noise, but because she's not, because she's not dis properly disciplined as a scientist, she somehow accidentally hears it, right? Because she doesn't think it's impossible. Um, and I think this has been a long-standing question in the history of science. I mean, you know, William James, an early like experimental psychologist, called it the unclassified residuum, the idea that there were things that didn't count as in our, in our field of sense perception, right? Or, or especially our privileging of vision as like the, the mode by which we see science, right? Um, and so this was the idea of all the different things that we felt, experienced, and for him they were like supernatural, right? The unclassified residuum was like, the ghost in the room or the thing that makes you shiver, you know, but there's also, that is, there is also sort of that thing. So he was saying that science could eventually figure it out, but it had to account for other kinds of senses and sensations um, that went beyond that. And it, 
it might be what we call supernatural, it might be what we call God. I don't know, I don't really have any, I don't, it's not really an important question to me, but the idea that there are things that we have not attuned ourselves to, I think certainly seems, um, and that seems that it will kind of continue to be true in many ways, right? And, and that's why this idea of like the accident, or I was thinking about art as being a kind of um, improper attunement to science, right? When the artist does science, it's a kind of like improper attunement that actually maybe allows you to perceive and think about science in new ways, right? Or have something else come across, so. Hi, can you just tell me the name of that scientist you mentioned earlier? Was it Dr. Raytheon? That's not my question, but my actual question is, uh, I just was curious what, I really enjoyed the summaries and the explanations uh, across the entire evening, and I, I was just curious how uh, the scientist Bohm, B-O-H-M, would, how you would summarize his contribution in relation to what you described this evening. Does, does that make sense? Be yeah, Bohm, I don't remember. The, science, the physicist Bohm. I don't Bohm. remember exactly what he did. Yes, I know David Bohm, but I can't remember exactly what he did at this point. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's some... I can't speak to that. What the, the first question, though, was... Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, the first question was about just the name of the scientist. You could spell it. That's... Oh, that I had just mentioned earlier? Yeah, the one you just mentioned oh, a few uh, seconds ago. Uh, Dean, minutes ago. D E. A N Raiden R A D I N. He's out in um, in California. I want to say like I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly where in California, um, but you can even just look him up. Okay, um, I Thanks. definitely recommend it. Thank you. There are a lot of books about David Bohm too. I just can't remember right now. <laughs> There's so many of them. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, Tina's examples of superposition, which I think were both wheels and ducks, um, but maybe also cats, are evidence of the quantum infecting the classical. You know what I mean? Like, is classical kind of on the way out in our ducks and wheels? And I guess I just want to throw the cat in to... Why do you use the word infection? Just kidding. <laughs> Maybe there's a better word. I think I'm still trying to understand how classical can exist after quantum exists. I love this question. I think it's an amazing question. I think that what my thought would be is something about how, um, for me, like what I've been working on is not, you know, um, well, Shani earlier was saying the right that there's a difference between. Um, you know, entanglement, what it really is with like quantum physics and what we mean when we use it as something like either a philosophical state or a metaphor or something like that. And I'm actually interested in the idea that maybe there's not such a big difference between those two things. You know, that um, the fact that those concepts were come up with, were uh, that people came up with them in the first place and then that people in culture find the need to use them often before, often precedes, right, the use of them in physics or the, or the reverse. It seems to me that those questions are coming from a similar epistemological place, from noticing and having observations that might be something like the unclassified residuum, right? Like the weird spooky action that happens in the diaspora or something like that, you know, between people. So it seems to me that this is the kind of, yeah, that, you know, there's a, whatever, an infection in the sentence and an infection in the like world or something, you know, this idea that, yeah, I don't know, I like it. The way they're like, bleed, maybe they're not quite so distinct, despite the fact that we were, like, that it's super important for most, like, quantum physicists to say, you know, this is the, this is what quantum entanglement is, and the other stuff is, like, a metaphor or something, or, or a, like, philosophy, so. I, I think as far as uh, superposition, or as far as superposition of states as a wave function, a probability wave function, within quantum physics, um, the, the duck metaphor or a tire metaphor, wheel metaphor, wouldn't be necessarily applicable because those are two things which are happening at once and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, that they can, you know, I, I can be sliding across the floor and also like tripping on my toes. Um, that those things can happen at once. I wouldn't necessarily call that a superposition of states. Um, a superposition of states uh, 
as far as within the quantum world would be this probability wave function um, that this can happen or this can happen. And once it observed, that's when it collapses. <coughs> that when it collapses, it can only be one of the two and that's the behavior that we see. Um, and I think, again, that has to do with uh, how we use the language um, and how we view how they bleed into each other. I wouldn't necessarily say in fact either, but how, how they overlap with each other. Um, and I think that that also varies from school of thought to school of thought. The end.